Next up, we're going to introduce the calling conventions of the Y86 processor. That's going to include describing what a stack frame is and how Y86 sets one up and uses it, and also using the call and ret instructions appropriately. Let's begin with demonstrating how call and return work. So the call is going to be one of our nine byte instructions, the opcode of eight, and it's gonna have one argument, which is a destination address. And the way you're gonna specify that address is either with some constant value, an immediate, or you can use a symbolic name to specify the destination. So if you look at the example code, what you'll see is that we set up some registers and then we call in the first case, address 1000, and in the second case, the symbolic address sum. And if you look at the bottom of the program, what you see is that we explicitly set the position of the next bit of code at location 1000. We then give it the name or label of sum, and we then execute some instructions. So you can use that address of hex 1000 or sum interchangeably. And so when we get to doing this in the simulator, you'll see that both of those calls do exactly the same thing. So the format of the instruction is call with the destination. Return is even simpler. It has opcode op nine and takes no arguments and just says whatever function call you're in, you need to return from it. And you can read the encoding of the instructions out for ret, very straightforward for the call, it's a little more complicated because we have the address, and as we saw with the immediate, we have to make sure that we get the little endian ordering correctly. So we'll specify the little byte first and then the next byte. So you'll see at the bottom that we do the call, the first byte is 0, 0, and the byte after that is the 1, 0. And so you put those together and you get the 1, 0 address. So recall our friend the stack. We're going to use the stack to keep track of the address that we want to return to after we go and use a call instruction to execute a function. So I'm actually showing the encoding of the program from the previous slide on the stack frame, and you'll notice that the two different call instructions are emboldened. Let's assume that we're executing the first, we're about to execute the first one. What we're going to do is we're going to take the address of the next instruction and push that onto the stack so that we can use it to return later. So let's recall how a push works. First, you decrement the stack pointer, sort of point to the place where we're going to store things onto the stack. And then we put a value on the stack. In this case, the value we're putting on is the address of the next instruction that we wish to execute. Now, this all happens automatically when you use the call instruction. You're not doing it explicitly, but it's behaving very much like a push. Now that you've pushed the return address, we can change the program counter so that it can execute the sum function. So now we're executing, we start executing at address 1000, which is where we placed the sum function, and eventually we get to the return value. So how do you suppose we're going to return? Well, the place we want to return to is on the stack. And so what we're really going to do is we're just going to pop that value off the stack and put it into the program counter. So let's recall how a pop works. We move the value into the program counter that we're removing from the stack. And so that says the next instruction we're executing is the one in red. And we increment the stack pointer so that it points to the next location on the stack. I've loaded the program that was on the slide into the simulator, and you'll notice that the first thing I'm going to do is put some value in the stack. The reason is that if I don't do that, the stack starts at address zero, and if I try to push something on it, that's going to cause a fault in the processor. So now we've initialized the stack. The next thing I'm going to do is to load two registers. So we load register RDI, and now we load register RSI. The next instruction I'm about to execute is a call. So I want you to pay attention to two things here. Notice that the value of the next PC down here is 1E. So that says that's the next instruction that I need to execute. And notice that the stack pointer is initialized to 2000. 
when I run one more cycle, two things have happened. I say the next address that I'm going to execute is actually address 1000 because I made a call. And you'll notice that I've changed the value of the stack pointer so that it now points one entry below where it did before. So I've actually pushed that return address. So now if I run one more cycle, you'll see that we're executing inside the sum function. You'll see that the next PC is inside the sum function. So I do the XOR, I do an add, I do the other add, and now I'm about to return. And so what we expect to happen is that we're gonna change the value of the PC instead of executing where it says it's going to, and we should see that we've popped a value off the stack up here. So we run one more cycle, and sure enough, what you see is that we've just executed the ret instruction. The stack pointer is now back to 2000, and the next instruction that we're going to execute is back at 27. And sure enough, the next instruction we execute is going to be the next call function. So far, when we've written programs in assembly, we've just decided where we're going to pass variables and we've set values into registers. In the prior example, we put them in RSI and RDI and assumed that the function we were calling knew that that's where the parameters were and that's where it should operate on them. Now that might work fine if we're all coding in assembly, but if we're not coding in assembly and I want to write one function and you want to write another function, we need to have some agreement on how we're going to communicate information. That kind of agreement is part of what are called calling conventions. So calling conventions are an agreement between the compiler, the hardware, maybe the operating system, and sort of all the pieces that put together programs so that we can agree on how we're going to communicate information between callers and callees. So the callee is the function that I want to invoke. So in the prior example, main was the caller and sum was the callee. The basic mechanism we're going to use is something called a call frame. And a call frame is a region on the stack that belongs to a particular function. And how that stack frame is set up is part of the calling convention. There are two different ways that we can manage stack frames one with a base pointer and one without a base pointer. I'm gonna step through both of those. Let's start with the no base pointer case, which means that everything we're going to do is going to be relative to a stack pointer. So in this case, the red box shows you the caller's stack frame. So this is everything that the caller controls. When I'm going to call a function, as we saw in the previous slide, the return address that the callee will come back to is put on the stack. Once the callee gets invoked, it's going to set up its stack frame. Now you know that you've written code and you've never had to do that. That's because the compiler is actually adding instructions in your program to set up a stack frame. And what those instructions do is they look at the local variables of the callee and say, okay, there are this many local variables that I need. So I better allocate enough space for all those local variables. And so if you look at assembly that the compiler generates, one of the first things it will do is it will move the stack pointer to create space for the local variables. Once the callee has established its stack frame, you'll notice that the local variables are all going to be positive offsets from the stack pointer. And in fact, if the caller transmitted information to the callee by pushing things on the stack, which is one way that we sometimes transmit arguments, and I'm gonna come back to that, then those are also positive offsets from the stack pointer. So once the callee has finished building its stack frame, which it's done here, then it knows that there are some constant values that it can use as offsets to get to its local variables and the parameters passed on the stack from the caller. Once the callee is done executing and is about to return, 
before it returns, it's going to restore the stack pointer to its previous state. And now when it issues the return instruction, the stack pointer is set up exactly correctly so that it will return to the appropriate address. And then once we return, the callee's return address is popped off and we're now back with the stack pointer pointing into the caller's stack frame. What does the caller do? Well, if the caller had pushed any stack parameters for the callee, then it needs to sort of undo that. And the way it does it is by adding an amount back to the stack pointer to account for the parameters that it pushed in the first place. So that's how we do stack frames when we're not using a base pointer. When we are using a base pointer, in addition to keeping track of RSP, we also maintain RBP, which is the base pointer. And this is true on both the x86 and the y86. The base pointer points sort of to the beginning of the stack frame or the way to think about it is it's the beginning of the stack frame, not including what the return address for the current function is. So in this picture, the caller's stack frame is in red and the base pointer is going to point to the next address in the stack. And in particular, what it's going to put there is in fact the previous copy of the base pointer. So let's step through this in a little bit more detail. Let's assume that the caller is about to call a function. Then we know that what happens is it pushes the return address onto the stack as shown here. When we're using a base pointer, the first thing that the callee does, and again, this is code that the compiler inserts, is it's going to save the current value of the base pointer. The way to think about the picture is that what you're doing is you're creating a linked list of stack frames where the base pointer points back to the previous stack frame. So in this case, we've now saved the last version of the base pointer, and now we can change RBP to point to the current stack frame. Then we assemble a stack frame just like we did in the previous example by inserting enough space for the callee's local variables. Now we can access both stack parameters and local variables relative to the base pointer. If we want to access local variables, those are going to be negative offsets from the base pointer and the parameters that the prior caller sent are going to be positive offsets from the base pointer. Finally, we have to tear down the, the stack frame. So the callee is getting ready to return. What does it have to do? Well, it's got to restore the stack pointer to where it was before it created a stack frame. So it's going to move the stack pointer. Then you should be in the position where the thing on the top of the stack is the saved base pointer. So we can pop that off. Now our stack is in exactly the same state it was before the caller invoked us, or actually right after we were called because our return address is there. And so now we can issue a return and we'll return to the right location. Having now gone through how we create stack frames, we've started to cover some of the details of these calling conventions that all the pieces of the system have to agree on in order to make things work together. There are a couple of other details. So calling conventions for the Y86 include the fact that RSP is in fact the stack pointer. It also includes conventions for how we're going to pass arguments to function calls. So like the x86, the first six parameters to a function call are going to be passed in registers. And in particular, they're going to be passed in these registers in order. So if there's a one argument function, it will go in RDI. If there is a three argument function, 
The first argument is an RDI, the second is an RSI, and the third is an RDX. And you can do this up to six parameters. If you have more than six parameters, then you start pushing parameters on the stack in reverse order. And a question I'm going to leave open for you that we can talk about in class is, what do you do if one of the parameters you want to pass is bigger than a register? Let's say it's a structure. What do you suppose you're going to do about that? So calling conventions include how we pass arguments to functions, and then unsurprisingly, how we return return values. And so on the Y86, we will return a value in the RAX register. The last piece of the calling conventions dictates who gets to use what registers or what guarantees you make about those registers. So we divide the register set into two camps, the caller saved registers and the callee saved registers. Caller saved registers are those registers that the caller cares about the contents. And so the caller is going to save those registers before making a function call because the callee is allowed to scribble all over them. So in this case, let's imagine that the caller had something valuable in RAX. If the caller wants to save that value, it better save it before making the call because the function's being called is going to have to return something in RAX. So that's an example of a caller saved register. In fact, all of the arguments are caller saved registers. And in addition, R10 and 11 are caller saved registers. So those are the registers that I need to make sure I keep copies of, potentially just by pushing them on the stack before I make a function call. In contrast, there are a bunch of registers that I, that the callee has to guarantee the callee will not change. And we already saw an example of that. The base pointer, when it comes back to me, the caller had better be unchanged. So in fact, it's the callee's responsibility to save that base pointer. And that's why the callee pushes the base pointer before it does anything else. And so on the Y86, the registers that the callee is responsible for saving include RBX, RBP, and then registers 12, 13, and 14.